All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Mentor Live. I'm Kevin Hardy, and behind me is the Ionic 5. So uh, today we're going to go through just kind of a, a quick body overview uh, with the vehicle itself and, uh, and kind of talk through some small and interesting things that we kind of seen along the way throughout the teardown, I guess it's um, with respect to the new eGMP platform. So that's the electric global modular platform that um, Hyundai Kia has put forward, and they're going to base essentially I believe it's 26 um, electric vehicles, both battery electric and probably hybrids going forward off of. Um, overall, it's, it's similar to many of the, um, in strategy to the way that uh, Hyundai Kia has executed many of these uh, front wheel drive platforms as far as how they execute major structural um, monuments themselves and material choices. Overall, this is a pretty much primarily steel body structure with essentially Lots of spot welding, a little bit of MIG welding. We'll kind of talk about some of that as we go through it. Um, the big notable change for the EVs is the inclusion of large extruded aluminum um, members within the sill sections themselves. Not really that well visible from outside of the vehicle itself, but there is um, you know, a lot of information online about the inclusion of these. And when we drop the battery, we can see that as well. Um, one of the big things that's kind of taken, uh, I think in some ways, the, the passenger vehicles by storm is, like this type of front end architecture. So many years ago, we used to actually kind of call it like a Honda-esque. Uh, I think they called it ACE, was their uh, Honda ACE body structure, which essentially has motor bay rails. These particular motor bay rails are splayed. And then essentially your upper load beam or FESM, which it's sometimes called, so front end structural module. Uh, coming down, joining here um, with a, a relatively large structural node itself. And then um, those provide the interface for the crush can. We really started to see this style of uh, front-end architecture being adopted once um, SORB came on the, on the scene for small overlap, rigid barrier for IIHS. And the Hondas performed pretty well out of the gate, and these are some of the structural elements that were present in their architecture already. Um, and then we've seen other OEMs move to that, um, to that body structure style for the for those type of vehicles that were either front wheel biased or um, more like utility based, you know, for like CUVs and things of that nature. So, um, you know, at least internally here, we often call it Honda-esque or, or Ace. Um, the Mach-E is very similar in its execution as well. Uh, a little bit different as far as how their structural, me structural members come down, but just another example of essentially that strategy being adopted by another OEM. And we've always considered Hyundai Kia to be extremely fast followers. Um, like in the true sense, there's other OEMs that try to do that, but um, Hyundai Kia for a traditional OEM responds very quickly and is able to incorporate stuff um, pretty fast as well from what we've seen. So kind of starting from the front, we have an extruded aluminum you know, uh, crush structure itself here. What's kind of interesting is they are bolting this together prior to probably welding to kind of get it fixtured up. Um, they're using rib nuts in the, the beam itself it's costly um, in, in some regards from the perspective of there's processes that's going on there. And then so essentially it's for this fasting operation, you're kind of doing two operations by inserting the rib nut itself. And then when you're bringing whatever component, I believe these support um, some radar components for the uh, self-driving aspect or at least accident avoidance. And then you're actually running the part itself. Um, so when we kind of cost these things out, uh, th this strategy does have a lot of penalties associated with it. That said, um, and I think Julian actually spoke to this with the battery pack, the, the inverse of this is essentially running a lot of material across the entirety of your extrusion, which is a weight and material hit there. So if you're not doing a ton of fasten operations, this is actually a pretty efficient way to go. Um, and it's, I think for a crush beam, if you're gonna be in aluminum and extrusions, which is capitally, you know, not that expensive, it's not a bad way to go if you're, if you're bringing components to it versus welding other inserts in um, or adding material so you can tap them themselves. As we kind of move you know, back through the, the, the rail itself, you can see here kind of this, this large integration here of the FESM coming down. They're boxing the structure out and some interesting kind of overlapping materials. Most of it's spot welded, which makes sense if they have uh, two-sided access. Um, anywhere you kind of see MIG welding or puddle welds means essentially this has come together, there's not the access, and then essentially they'll have a MIG machine or station on the line um, for that. Domestically, uh, a lot of the domestic OEMs 
do not like to do that. Um, they try to stick with essentially strategies that either provide access so they can spot weld everything together and they don't have a lot of complexity in their plants. Um, but there's not necessarily anything wrong with this. And frankly, we've actually seen a shift away in I would say the last five to 10 years of um, Pacific, or excuse me, domestic OEMs adopting some Pacific strategies where they're either using MIG welding to tie in some, some of these, uh, these sections together or bolting structural members into the vehicle itself, um, which in the past, we, they didn't really like to do, they like to do large, simple stampings, you know, a higher capital investment, less part count, and um, overall, like, less joining operations themselves. But there's something to be said about smaller parts, lower tonnage, and um, potentially less scrap and off fall. Because when you look at some of these parts, they're complex. Ideally, you'd want to get these nested to get as much utilization as the parts as you can, but sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get high utilization from oddly shaped parts. And you see a lot of that with some aspects of these front ends. As we kind of like swing around here from the side, you can kind of see a little bit of essentially the, both the, the cradle itself and the rest essentially the front impact structure. So we, again, we have this layered phesum coming down, a very large bulkhead. Um, if you want to come in here, race and, and shoot through this side. Um, that's reinforcing this zone. And then the cradle has another engagement point here. This is the stanchion that comes up and this would bolt and deck to it. It's kind of shifted a little bit. But essentially you have loads that go up, in, and then down to the cradle itself. Um, this area through like the, the, the series of iterations of Hyundai Kia products that we've seen has gotten a little bit more um, robust and a little bit more expansive. Um, as I think the weight of the vehicles have overall increased. I've always kind of commended the Hyundai Kia execution because they've been able to perform well in SORB, which is um, more of a North American, it's not a requirement, but essentially it is a, a third party requirement at this point, um, crash test, which is strenuous on the vehicles. And they've always done a really good job of not incorporating a lot of additional material forward of the axle and more specifically forward of the dash panel. Um, the nice thing about that is you're obviously not building as many things up. And, you know, from a, a customer perspective, you're not buying a lot of weight or material that is only used in a specific crash event. Um, we, we never would advocate really, you know, cost over safety, but there's strategies and how you balance things. And Hyundai Kia has done a really good job. They've kind of been on the bleeding edge of that, been able to incorporate essentially a lot of structure within the passenger cell itself and uh, direct energy to avoid excessive like masses up in the front end and keep it relatively well integrated within the primary load paths. But um, if you were to go through and look at the IH data, it is, you know, top safety pick plus green across the board. As we kind of move forward, um, or excuse me, rearward in the vehicle. Um, I just kind of want to, if you want to swing around, you can kind of see across. So this is like some bolt-in structure. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting here, this is common, and this is the complement, another load path, which I'll show you um, from the FESM. But, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's raw steel, it's painted, so this is kind of a final line assembly feature. Um, the mach -E doesn't have something in a similar zone. They actually reinforce with some large bolt-in structure on the, the base of the hinge pillar. We'll kind of swing around here. Um, so the Maki -E does have some bolt-in reinforcements, but one of the kind of key differences is, is that goes through paint. So we're seeing this, it's coming after line, final line assembly. So typically speaking, a little bit higher assembly line rates uh, to have this bolted on after the fact before going into the, um, the body shop and being painted with the vehicle itself. Uh, not always the case, but um, more often than not, depending on how that, that breakdown is and where these vehicles are being built up, given the way kind of Hyundai Kia are set up and how vertically integrated they are, it pretty much probably falls all under their umbrella and nothing is going outside of the OEM for assembly. And if you want to kind of swing around here just to see what that brace is complementing. So some people would say that's a Band-Aid. I think when you rotate, if you want to just come across here, you see this part of the phesum here. And then on the inside, there's another panel that reaches and goes into the, the dash panel itself. So I think it's a little bit more purposeful. Um, when you look at some of the literature that Hyundai Kia have, they really stress the, the flexibility of this platform, various interior volumes, IP depths, and things of that nature. So to me, I think it's a, I don't necessarily think it's a Band-Aid per se, it's just a, a way that they essentially can achieve the buildup of this inner joint um, and provide a load path into the hinge pillar itself that's suitable for you know, multiple vehicles. As we kind of move our way back to the vehicle, You'll, you'll notice that essentially a lot of this architecture is kind of like a ladder frame on the, the, the top side for the, the reinforcements. Um, it's interesting that they have this center console aspect here. Um, 
they do a lot to try and get the load down into this seat cross member here. It splays out to like an inner torque box and also to here, um, given how defensively they're kind of orientating their strategy for small overlap. And then I imagine, you know, some aspects of this center structure is um, to help prevent um, intrusion from the drive module into the occupant space. And more specifically, since uh, typically your legs aren't in that area, the leading edge of high voltage connectors in the battery cell itself. Um, the big thing obviously with EVs is um, maintaining the occupant space and the battery. They, they nicely kind of coincide with each other from that perspective. Um, and it is kind of interesting if you, again, look through some of Hyundai Kia's literature, they have a whole testing facility that they, they test a lot of these vehicles for. And then these are, you know, they are global vehicles. So they have to suit a number of regulatory requirements. You know, what happens in Euro NCAP, for instance, is different than here in uh, the North American market and then other markets in the world. But they put a lot of emphasis on essentially the ability to stretch and short both the wheelbase of the, this portion of the vehicle itself. And, um, and accommodate different module sizes and supports for different seating arrangement. The one thing I did kind of want to point out, so we have a higher like optioned Ionic 5 here. So this one does have a fixed panoramic roof. Um, so if you want to rotate and kind of come in here, what I really like about this is essentially this panoramic roof is bonding to this, this flange here um, directly. So there's no excessive material coming inboard in like the Y direction off this. Um, it's essentially just what they need here for the pinch weld to weld and bring all the, the body side outer and the inner roof structure and the cant rails together. Your um, handrails here themselves or the, the grab handle brackets also mount to the same flange. Um, it's not necessarily a directly apples to apples comparison, but one of the things that's interesting is the Mach-E, which also offers a fixed roof. This flange, and there is some volume and section to it, extends inward about another 75 or so. Uh, so probably between 75 and 90 millimeters inboard, where uh, the Ionic keeps it very short. There's no excessive material um, there. And granted, you know, they might have very different functional requirements, but um, it's one thing that, you know, you look at those length of line of those panels and some of these inner stampings, that's all material, it's all cost, it's all weight. As we kind of move rearward in the vehicle, you know, Jordan and I always kind of talk about how clean the uh, Hyundai Kia execution is with their troughs. Um, they're able to manage the seal or the hemline seal here relatively well. The stamping looks good. There's not a lot of you know, um, wrinkles or anything like that. So they are able to get away with essentially not doing any sort of like um, ex interior covers or covers with, um, with respect to there. So just one part that's not needed and they just show you know, the body color itself. As we kind of move rearward, this is one of our favorite things um, that like Hyundai Kia has done um, on a lot of their vehicles now is a composite rear impact beam. So. On this particular vehicle, they have a relatively traditional crush can, you know, just e-coded with some guiding features for assembly um, that nests, oh, of course I do it upside down, um, roughly like so. And um, this in turn does bolt to this. I, I want to say it's been a long time that there's executions of this where they have no crush can and they just use like the depth of draw with the part itself to create one. But obviously with a kind of global platform, and unique requirements for any vehicle, whether it's overhang or things of that nature, you're gonna to have to swap out some of these parts. So you might, be able, you might not be able to incorporate a crush can uh, within this every time. And frankly, sometimes steel is the right material um, to use depending on what you're trying to do for deceler decelerization or what you're trying to protect on the, on the vehicle side. But this is one thing that we've always liked. You have a series of integration for various um, exterior fascia um, inputs here. And then um, you know, it's, it's a, essentially one solid piece, a very thick um, injection molded uh, polypropylene glass fill 40 piece. And this is something they've done for, I wanna say like at least five to six years or so. And uh, it's, we brought it up a few times with other customers. Um, they all, they typically consider it to be very risky, which it's not to say that it isn't, you know, uh, modeling and doing, you know, finite element analysis for composites, especially for impact events is troublesome. Um, which is why you don't often see them in front structure, uh, especially specifically body structure. But um, on the rear, it's a little bit easier and some of the requirements are a little bit less stringent. So um, it's a good opportunity to try this out, this technology out, get a lot of data uh, with relatively low risk to you know, the customer um, or the manufacturer for that matter. Um, but like, you know, overall, when you, we look at this vehicle, it's, it's in some ways, it's exactly what I expected to see even though it's been kind of tweaked in, um, in every regard 
from its migration um, to an EV. Um, strategically, it's very, very similar to past Hyundai Kia products that we've seen um, and, and teardowns that we have done. So uh, very much in line, essentially, with its material strategy being mostly steel, and they, they focus a lot on essentially giving you know, a lot of content to the customers and select areas. It's very efficient um, for the interior side and same thing on kind of the body. Um, not a lot of exotic material usage, mostly steel. Again, there's some uh, aluminum use used in rockers themselves, um, but it's still pretty weight competitive. So it's, it's, it's light with respect to the vehicles that we have in the building, um, the lightest one. There's obviously some trade-offs as far as when you start putting like impact structure and some other things on there. But overall for the body and white bucket, it's a very light um, all steel body that we have here. And it's executed well, you know, most of the joints look pretty good. Um, the ceiling looks, looks good. And um, you know, it's, it's not a bad value proposition uh, for customer as well. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see some of the other vehicles kind of in the future. So this is the first of their kind of not the first per se, but uh, one of the first of their suite of new vehicles coming out. And more specifically, I'm, I'm very curious to see how long, specifically with larger vehicles, when they get into three row, um, how, lo how long they can like, hang on to such an efficient strategy here in the front end. And when they may or may not have to introduce either larger section volume, which is one of the things that they did do on the EVs. If you were to compare a gas vehicle to this, it looks very similar, but essentially the entire section of this grew um, to accommodate the increased weight. But um, I'm very curious to see on something like the, uh, the EV9 or something like that, you know, something the size of a Telluride, how efficient the front end structure will remain going forward on the, uh, the eGMP platform. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see. There's still kind of a lot of um, ice elements as far as the impact structure strategy, the cooling, uh, this cooling, mod cooling module support, excuse me, and, um, and how, in some ways, how little room that would allow you if you were to incorporate a frunk within this. Um, I know the last vehicle we saw with the Lexus, um, there was some fixed structure going on there that suggests maybe they are kind of incorporating some closed structural elements within the architecture back into it on the Toyota side. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we see other OEMs start to adopt more of the structure coming in where um, decking essentially large vertically uh, packaged cooling modules is not necessarily needed anymore where there's a lot of interest in getting front space and laying these cooling modules down um, and you know there might be an iteration where essentially this is all gone from the body structure it's in the or excuse me as a, like a cooling module substrate and goes into the body structure and whether it's decked from below or dropped in from the top the cooling module is laid down because um, while this does have a frunk it's um, it's very small and expensive for how much volume it has and what you can uh, what you offer to the customer. But uh, overall, I'm excited to see kind of where things go from here. Um, and it's a it's a pretty good and you know conservative execution. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that as far as material use and stuff like that. You know, the steels have only gotten better as vehicles on the ice side were trying to lightweight. Um, you know, the steel industry has responded with a lot of new high strength steels, a lot of everything to get down gauged. And while it is all steel, it's pretty weight efficient. So um, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the kind of tour real quick of the, the Ionic 5. Uh, really appreciate it and I appreciate the chance to talk to you guys. So thank you very much and uh, tune in for the next video.